We've made a very complex industry, as people know, with the 100,000 brokers, with the 500 MLSs, with your local, state, and national association. There's a lot of complexity to how those parts all fit together. More products, more competition, but better decisions for the brokers and agents. 90% of what we do that's the same, that needs to be structured and have rules and follow that. And then the creativity comes in that 10% space outside of that. Welcome back to Nevada Realtors Today, your place for timely updates on the news and trends that matter to realtors in the Silver State. Now let's join your Nevada Realtors President, Brandon Roberts, and Nevada Realtors CEO, Tiffany Banks, for today's episode of Nevada Realtors Today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are very lucky to have the incredible Sam DeBoard, who is the CEO of the Real Estate Standards Organization. He's going to let us know in a moment how to um, pronounce that. And he is the author of Working with Real Estate Data, Organized Real Estate's premier technology course for onboarding and professional development. So Sam, thank you so much um, for, for joining us here today. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. And thanks for having me, Tiffany. Excited to be here. Um, yeah, so my name is Sam DeBoard again. Um, I am a former real estate broker. So I uh, grew up in this industry as a real estate agent, uh, team leader, became a managing broker and worked uh, with a management team and ownership team for a, a multi-state franchise. So we share a lot of, of that world in terms of the experience with the practitioners. What I do now at uh, Riso is we do data standards. And that sounds like a very boring topic when you say it out loud. Um, but I think we can relate some of what we do to um, the end value we provide, which is really to the agents and the brokers. They're the biggest beneficiaries at the end of the day of what we do. So to, to explain the concept, um, a lot of people are familiar with the concept of Wi-Fi and of Bluetooth. These are open standards. You expect any device that you buy to just work with those standards. You expect your headphones, your cell phone, your car, your PC, your laptop, to all just be able to connect and flow data in between those things. And it's a given for us, but it's not such a given in the real estate world. So what we do at Riso is we create those kinds of open standards to make sure that the data that you put into the MLS for a new listing can flow to your agent tools, to your consumer websites, to your broker back office systems, um, and we use the same language, Risa's data dictionary and web API, to be able to make sure all of your tools do that seamlessly. Even though a lot of your tools work today, a lot of them have a lot of workarounds to actually be able to connect to each other. And the more they use Riso standards to connect, the more simplified that becomes and the better access you have to, to products and different choices for your brokerage or for your agent needs in terms of technology. That is extraordinarily fascinating because when one of those connections don't work, I know the level of frustration. Actually, my Bluetooth headphones didn't work this morning. One didn't work, then one did, and I'm having to turn them all off, turn them back on. And then I felt so proud of myself that I'm a technological genius because I was able to figure out how to reconnect and then actually um, hear them both loudly. So I understand like that. And, and right now, aren't we in an age that so many people expect everything to flow so seamlessly that if there's a glitch or it doesn't, like there's this massive level of frustration. Yeah, the expectations are high, definitely. <laughs> the things we depend on to work. Um, a lot of us, if we just had to get in our car and drive around and tour a bunch of homes and um, the phone didn't connect to the Bluetooth to the car, um, it would be a, just a, a very terrible and frustrating experience because it's worked for us so well in so many ways. So that that's the expectation of consumers. And that's what we need to be able to support in the real estate industry. So when you, what inspired you to write the Working with Real Estate data and how did your background in real estate influence the book? Sure. So that, um, that course that we've written is really to try to help everybody get a, a baseline understanding of real estate technology and data. It's complex. We've made a very complex industry as people know with the 100,000 brokers, with the 500 MLSs, with your local, state, and national association, um, there's a lot of complexity to how those parts all fit together. And I find it took me many, many years to understand how all these things work together uh, from a brokerage perspective, but I also worked with NAR for a lot of years on policy, technology policy in particular, and MLS policy. 
Um, and it felt like there was a lot of information, great information in different silos, association information over here, brokerage information within each brokerage, technology information more vendor by vendor. So we thought, let's make a non-technical guide that anyone could take in the industry, whether or not they understand how APIs work. They just need to understand that these are just the sockets that the data flows out of um, and how each different participant in the industry affects the way their data gets from listing creation all the way to listing closing and, and output on the web. Um, and, and we wanted to be able to help our members, our member organizations of RISO onboard new staff, um, whether they're an association, an MLS, a brokerage, and level up their ability to understand how the industry works. Instead of spending five years making mistakes and learning, mm. spend a few days taking a course um, and understand years worth of training through that. Yeah, that should almost be required. It sounds like like that would be incredible. It It is. We have a, a number of companies who do this with every one of their new employees now that onboard their new employees. We've got big technology organizations that are sending 100 or more employees a year through the course. So who are your members? Like, could we as an organization association be a member of yours? So as some associations are members, uh, the National Association of Realtors founded RISO. Um, it's still our, our biggest primary supporter in terms of membership. Um, so within that, we have you know associations and MLSs generally. So we have about 500 MLSs that are member organizations of RISO. Um, we have the large technology companies, the public facing portal companies that we all know. Um, we have large brokerage organizations and franchisors nationally. Um, and we have uh, interesting members that come in from outside of the traditional organized real estate space. So we've got an assessment company from uh, Ontario and Canada, and they work with our technology. Um, we've got government organizations from, um, well, we've got members in over 20 countries now. So we've yeah. got government organizations who have the same need to have good information as the brokers do. They want that data to flow in their systems as well so they can make good planning decisions. Um, they can make good decisions on, on zoning and development and that sort of thing. Um, and they all want access to good information. So it's a wide group and it's broadening quickly as we've done a lot of great work in the MLS space, um, which is the most important link for us to start with. But now we can spread more value to these other companies that are either in the industry or sort of tangential to the industry and use our data. That's so impressive. And making sure that that data is actually right on and able to be used, because I think that sometimes people worry about it being skewed. Like what kind of, um, do you guys actually work on anything to make sure that it's accurate? Like the actual accuracy that you're flowing out? Uh, the accuracy is up to the MLSs and the brokers and the okay. vendors to create the data. Okay. So it's our job to make sure it's formatted correctly and that it's got a shape and a direction that it can flow so that everybody can use it. Um, okay. That's why it's great to have organizations like MLSs that have rules about putting things in timely, keeping things accurate. Um, so that's sort of the partnership and we play our part in that. Um, in that process. And obviously with, it, with the brokers as well, inputting that data, it's got a lot of different broker rules, MLS rules, um, sometimes association rules, et cetera. Um, roster data with association management companies hmm. can be a very difficult thing to keep right. in line and accurate. Um, so we, we partner with other organizations, but we don't, uh, at RISA, we don't tell organizations how to set up their data um, in terms of what they put in as long as it fits the shape of the standard. So Sam, thanks, uh, Brandon here. The, the um, you know, I, all I'd ever heard of RISO is I'd served on our local MLS board and it's a, it's a big part of what we do. Um, I guess in, in syncing everything out. Um, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to hear that you guys are in, in other areas of, of things too, for, for brokers and different things like that. What are some of the, big tools or, or big things that you could do for uh, an independent broker or somebody? Yeah, I think the biggest benefit that the uh, the brokers get is that we certify their technology vendors. At the end of the day, brokers and agents shouldn't really have to think about resale. 
um, unless they're a huge company who builds its own software platforms, they should just get the positive effects of what Riso does for them. So we certify technology companies. We have a technical certification program um, where we'll, we'll go through their data set. This is a, a voluntary thing that member organizations submit for certification. And we run through their data set and make sure that it conforms to the standard, that it's accessible. Now the brokers can ask their vendors, have you been RISO certified? Um, is this something that's going to connect with the other systems that we work with? Um, RISO is not the only part of the story. As you know, brokers have to make a lot of decisions about features and capabilities and um, what sort of things you know will mesh together in that seamless experience that we were talking about. Um, but it is one good question to be able to ask your vendors is, are you aware of RISO? Are you a RISO member? Have you had your data set certified with RISO, which is something we didn't do in the past. We just certified MLS systems in the past, but we now have what's called RISO common format, which is just, if you've got a package of data, whether that's roster data, whether it's listing data, whether it's sold records, can you package that up in RISO format so that any of the other vendors you work with can receive it in that format? And if everybody understands what that format looks like, You've got certainty in working with different vendors, like a broker usually does work with lots of different vendors who are trying to aggregate information. Um, we work with uh, an AMS company um, who works with lots of associations and MLSs, um, and they've gotten their data certified to be able to do this too. We know that's a, a frustration in the industry is getting the AMS information to the MLS and then into the broker back office systems. It's not a seamless process generally. Uh, and we talk to all the technology vendors about that. So um, it's just a good question for brokers to be able to ask uh, a vendor, whether they're first aware, second a member, and third certified. And that doesn't mean it's not a great product that they haven't done all those three steps, but it's an awareness thing to be able to have that conversation. We had Ash Stinton on um, last week on our podcast, the executive director of Reach, and she was telling us a lot about, you know, like all their new technology and these companies. Do you work hand in hand with the new like technology companies as they're creating what technology works and kind of help as an advisor? Or do you have any interplay with with what those new startup companies are doing? We do. We work a lot with the REACH companies. Um, we have a relationship there where we give a free membership for the first couple of years to new REACH companies as they come into the industry because we want them to understand this early. Um, they need to understand that if they go work in one MLS marketplace and everything's great and they sell to a few brokers, they feel like they're going to be able to scale across the country. But if they've done something proprietary and they don't understand how the standards work yet, they're going to have a broker or an agent come up to them at a booth at a conference and say, hey, I want to buy this product. Little do they know when they go into the next MLS to get that data set, it's a different process for them because they've done something in a custom way that's not aligned with the standards. So we try to help teach them early on. If you build your systems to accept standardized data, you can go to the standard web API at every MLS and pull that data down. And it's going to be the same format and it's going to flow much more easily for you. Um, and I think that's it's an important thing for agents and brokers because I, I'm sure, Brandon, um, do every one of your products that you use make you 100 percent happy and have all of the features that you wish they had? Uh, I, I tried to put together tech stacks as a broker as well. And sometimes what is working well enough is what you stick with because it's just in place and there are only a few options in some categories. And by working with these startups and helping them get really the ability to have more runway for their products by getting earlier into a standardized sort of format, the way they accept them, the way that they transport data, they have a better chance to live longer and give us more products, have more strong companies coming up that we can trust to be around for a few years that brokers might have the confidence um, and teams and agents to buy those products because that makes competition and that makes life better for all of us in terms of product choices. Data is important to everybody, right? And and a lot of people don't understand 
how important it is even in, in the real estate sales side of it. You allow the, the software to basically talk to other softwares to make it easier to get data. Is that correct? Uh, essentially, yes. Okay. And then, um, so, I mean, how can a real estate professional effectively use data to make better decisions? Yeah, I, th I, I like the way you phrase that um, because that is the end, the end goal. More products, more competition, but better decisions um, for the brokers and agents. So that's our ideal. Um, you know, the core kind of getting into the guts a little bit of, of what we do is, um, you know, you can look at a technology system that's built in a proprietary way in this market and they call the price the ask price. And in this system, they call it the listing price. And in this one, they call it the list price. Um, and that's because we built these systems 10, 20 years ago sometimes. And those core products in the MLS systems are still using that original data, the way they called you know, certain parts of the data set. And then they sort of put a layer over top of it where you can get a standardized version where it gets transformed. So every one of these data sets calls it list price. Well, as an agent and a broker trying to make decisions because you're doing recruiting and you're doing forecasting and you're doing sales planning um, with your individuals and with your company, a lot of times you're having to try to mash that data together yourself. I think in particular, roster data and production data. My experience was that was a very difficult process. Um, there were a couple of products out there that helped you do that. But those vendors were the ones in the background trying to mesh these sets of data together that weren't standardized, that weren't easy to put together. So that's one of the goals is not just additional products, but better data so that whether you're an MLS or a broker or a team or an agent, you can actually look at those forecasts and those trends and get great data on what's happening now because you have the MLS data which is the most timely, accurate data source in the industry. But you've also got good historical data to look at where you've been and, and what trend line you're on. And that's been one of the difficult parts is not just putting that nice layer of standards on today's data feed with today's listings, but having to go back and get some very crusty old data out of some older systems to help brokers really understand, you know, more than just what's right in front of them right now. Um, and it, it is it is one of the big goals um, of having quality data is we, we had a, an MLS we worked with on a case study recently who had gone through four different MLS systems over the past 15 years or so and had to go back and retrieve all of those different data sets and try to put it together. And this is a very highly technical staff they were able to do it, um, but it's rare and it's difficult, but it's really important for brokers and agents to be able to track that sort of thing. Sam, our next question was, can you provide an example of a real estate project or scenario where data analysis made a significant difference? Yeah, so we were right on that track already. Yeah. Um, so it, we're, we're producing this on our website. So this it was Triangle MLS, which we were working with at the time to document the process that they went through. We don't, at Riso, we don't do the technical implementation for these organizations. We just test it to make sure it's in compliance. They do the legwork to make these things happen. So they decided at a certain point, they wanted to give their agents the choice of what interface to use in the MLS. We know every MLS has a primary interface where they do uh, listing input and listing search, but also reports. You've got you know CMAs and production numbers and lots of other reports. Um, to help you plan and to help you sell in your business. And they wanted to let their agents choose because lots of times when you do mergers and acquisitions, somebody's used to using this product A that they've used for 10 years. Well, this you know new MLS that's joining forces is used to product B. And a lot of folks really don't like changing the interface that they use on their MLS system. You're, you're busy, you're out there selling every day. You've got clients constantly wanting something from you changing the way you do something as simple as putting in a listing can be frustrating. Um, so they went through that process of basically rebuilding their entire back end so that it could connect to three different systems that all of their agents used at one time or another, and then just give them that choice of what they wanted to use. If they like these kinds of reports, if they like this kind of search, if they like this kind of mapping product, 
they could just choose on their own, um, which is fairly rare. Most MLSs don't have that capability to just give that kind of choice to the agents. Um, and, and it's not right for every organization. It's not necessarily the right thing for every MLS, but it was an interesting opportunity that they saw and they used RISO standards as the guide because that was the thing that they could stick to for the guardrails for the project. When one vendor didn't agree with another one, the standard was the decision maker. Yeah. It's a lot of what you're talking about is so in line with the growing pains that our agents are currently facing with the new settlement. And they know a lot of the conversations that Brandon and I have been having is, you know, he says this is going to be painful for a while or as we start to navigate a new norm of whatever the ways of doing business, this is going to be painful for a while. And I think understanding that, and it sounds again, very similar to when you're making that kind of shift that hopefully at the end of the day is better. And and obviously, like you're saying, a lot of MLSs wouldn't even have those capabilities to be able to have that option for the agents, but that's outstanding. And then once they get there and they get through the growing pains, they'll be happy probably that they made that shift. But providing the guardrails is something that we as an association are always trying to do as well. Like, we're just going to provide you the guardrails, stay within this, be creative with how you do it, but just don't go outside. Like, don't try to do some crazy workaround that's just going to fail and not be good for any of us. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, you know, growing pains are still growth. It's, you know, it might might hurt in the process. But uh, like you said, there's there's positives at the other end. Um, and, and there have to be rules. That's what you do as an association. That's why the brokers agree to come together in an association or an MLS is to have common rules that we're going to abide by and then to be creative outside of that. So it's the same sort of thing with the standards. Um, we don't tell an MLS that you can't have something really interesting and creative that you do in your market that other markets don't. That's great. Um, it's just that some of the things we all do, we all know this 90% of what we do that's the same, that needs to be structured and have rules and follow that. And then the creativity comes in that 10% space outside of that. And for agents, it's probably more like 50-50 because that's a very creative group. Um, but there are still common rules that we have that, that make that work that make that cooperative process in the association, in the MLS, and even within a brokerage really work. Um, and while that can feel constricting sometimes to some folks, the benefits for the market are just, uh, the, they outweigh that feeling of constriction so much. So Sam, your whole life, have you been a rule follower? Uh, I don't suppose that. <laughs> Let's say we get back to that uh, 90 10 rule. Yes, um, I like the 90 10 rule. That's, that's an interesting on the spot question. Uh, I suppose I should say yes from where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brandon, do you have another question for Sam? No, I, I think this is it. This is neat because you don't realize as an agent or even a broker how much Rezo plays a part in our everyday business. Um, because you just think things just work, but I think your analogy of, of tying it to your, your Bluetooth and all that type of stuff makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's fascinating that, that all this stuff's there and it's, it's, I guess it's, I always understood it as kind of, it was like a dictionary of words to communicate with. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. The data dictionary is probably our best known product. Um, and while it's, written in English, um, it's multi-language. It can be done in any language. So um, the it's a good example of the creativity that we have along with the rules. So we have data fields and they have names and they're in English. But if in your market, you call it something different, that's fine. For example, if we have patio in the data dictionary, then if everyone's gonna transfer data between their systems, it needs to be called patio when it's being transferred. But your website, your marketing reports, your listing searches, it could call it Lanai in Hawaii, and that would be fine if that's what the people know it as. Um, it could be called something else in a different language in a different system. We work with Canadian um, MLSs, and they're required by law to have their data in two different languages. Um, you can put those labels on top of data dictionary standardized data. So the data still flows across frankly, countries and different languages, 
but you put those local labels on top so that the users get the experience that they want. Um, and that really provides that, that flexibility. Uh, you know, the other thing we always talk about is if you had a field in um, Hawaii that was miles to volcano, that might be an interesting field in a certain part of the world. It would probably not be used in the vast majority of other markets. Uh, the dictionary doesn't limit you to having interesting local things that you do in your market. That's great. That can be part of the data set as well. The only requirement is if it's actually a list price, then it needs to be called a list price when it goes through the data feed. So we're really the interface in between companies. What this company does here and this company does here can be as creative and interesting as they need it to be for their market. But when they're going to interface and exchange that data, that's where it needs to fit the standard to make sure these systems can talk. Yeah. So Sam, what current trends in real estate data analysis do you find most exciting and how do you see them shaping the future of our industry? I think continuing to see um, data sharing, not necessarily just a, an MLS data share, but combining data sets across markets, across MLSs, uh, across countries, um, where we can start to see where things are aligned or not aligned. We can start to see why some of the things in our industry, why some of our technology doesn't work that well, why some of our reports are missing some of the information that we would like to have to, to help us make those decisions. So we everything we build at Reso is based on member organizations' input. The members elect a board of directors. They tell us what the membership wants to have happen with the industry, and we build that for them. So these reports that we put out from MLSs now for certifications, they list all of the data coming out of that system. They list how often it's being used in that market. Uh, they list what the names of all the fields are, what's available there. And it allows technology companies to just look at a third party report, an objective report and say, well, we're trying to do a data share in our market. And these three MLSs want a data share, but it's not working. Our technical vendors are having problems well, here's the third party report that tells you why. You've got this field, they've got this field. This third MLS doesn't use that field. This one has it missing. Um, and it's just that that transparency that we really didn't have in the past. Um, MLS data was sort of a closed one off in each location sort of situation. Um, and being able to publicize transparent reports about what data is there allows all those companies to do better planning to look at who might be good data partners for us because we're already really well aligned with that data set. There's not a lot of work to do versus, wow, if we're going to do a data share with the other MLS across town, it's going to take us a while. We can see how misaligned our data sets are. And then the vendors and the brokers who are going to get that downstream data could plan and look at the tools that they want to build and whether it's new apps or reports and say, Am I going to get the data that I need to fuel these tools to make them work the way I want? I can just look at a transparent report now and see that. How do you envision the role of data in real estate evolving over like the next, let's just say, five to 10 years? I, I wish I could give a definitive answer on that. I don't like to make projections. Looking for crystal ball <laughs> of predictions these days. Um, you know, I think people like to say data is the new oil, um, and, and whether you believe that to its fullest extent or not, it's clear that our entire lives are shifting toward data-driven tools that create efficiency, that make things faster, easier, quicker, bring us insights. Um, companies are not pouring billions of dollars into these AI systems and training them on massive data sets if they didn't see that that was the future for really all businesses, consumer facing and, you know, B2B sort of businesses. So it'll certainly become more valuable. It'll be interesting to see how well um, as an industry, we continue to have the rules to ensure that that data is accurate, which is the role of the MLS right now. And is the role of the association in terms of roster data right now but still allow it to be transparent and be accessible. And there was a traditional 
sort of default to it's ours, it's valuable, protect it, which is good. It should be protected, um, but it doesn't get valuable unless it's used. So we've got to have ways to appropriately use that to give value back to the creators as well. But to fully maximize its value, it's got to be out in the world. And the rest of the world has to recognize this is the most accurate and valuable data source there is in the real estate industry. And I think there are some, you know, there, there's some movement in that direction from the industry. There has been for a long time. And we need to continue moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think this is really, really helpful when thinking about, you know, like why MLS exists, right? Because I think that that's been a question throughout some of the settlement. And it's not just about that compensation field. It's about much more. And I think that you're actually bringing to light a lot of that, which I didn't even quite think about before we went on this podcast today, Brandon, but actually the importance of sharing that data, the collaboration not having to redo, like you're saying, the the wheel from like start to finish, if there's already like information that exists and you're able to share it, like it's, it's, I'm actually very, very impressed with, with hearing how all this works. If you travel to another country, which we now do international MLS forums and work with a lot of, um, a lot of folks who lead associations or brokerages in other countries they all want an MLS system. It might be a little different. There'll be different legal requirements. Maybe they won't do compensation the same way. Um, that's fine. What they all want is the ability to transfer data between brokers and have the rules that make that work well, because everyone has the ability to transfer right. data between brokers today, and it doesn't work well in most countries. The portals have the same listing listed five times at three different prices, it's already been sold or it might never have even been a listing wow. um, without those rules of the MLS system. It just doesn't work the way it should. Yeah. Brandon, do you have any final questions or thoughts for Sam? Well, kind of, kind of a statement, um, you know, you mentioned that everyone was protective of their data. People didn't want to really let uh, the MLS data out. Um, I, I think it's more, important not that you pr protect it or shield it it's it's kind of how you use the data so i mean i guess question would be how how can data analysis help us in understanding and predicting market trends in the future yeah i mean that's that's a great question um i think that we need to see the value of the data for one thing as you said it's got to be used in the right way so that we can ensure that it's the right data to make that analysis happen we've got new initiatives now where um, MLS data is being resold, not to other MLSs or brokers, but to financial institutions under a strong license, under the permission of the brokers and the MLS marketplace. And it's starting to put a, a value, a price on what that data is worth. Um, and I think that increases the ability of brokers and of MLSs to invest more in better data and broader data. We um, record just so much information in a listing, but there are so many more data sets we could bring into the MLS space to help with that analysis. We see these companies coming in and augmenting MLS data with flood information, insurance information, um, you know, climate information, risk zones, uh, all kinds of environmental data that can sort of augment that and allow us to do better analysis than just here are the square footage, the bedrooms, the bathrooms, and the price that it's sold for. So as long as that MLS is sort of the cornerstone of the accurate data, and we can continue to bring in insights that agents and brokers have and that outside entities have um, to just augment that value, I think we'll keep growing our ability to get good you know, quality insights and, and make better decisions based on that. Sam, in closing, how do you think technology has impacted the way real estate professionals collect and analyze data? And what tools or platforms do you recommend if you can recommend any? So I do not recommend platforms because most of them are our member organizations and we try to be very independent in that space. Um, I, I think it's important to look at the new tools that are coming out. Um, you know, as I said, as Brandon knows well, 
it's hard to change processes when your day to day is keeping a consumer happy with the transaction. That's the most important thing in their life right now. Mm -hmm. um, but the tools that are coming out now from traditional big companies that we've worked with for many years and the ones that are coming from new startup companies are really exciting because we've gotten so much better. We've gotten our technology tuned up to a level now where they can start bringing in new features and new things. And just like this augmentation of data that we're bringing floor plans and 3D tours, um, you know, all kinds of things that just make the experience better for not just the broker, but for our customers. So it's important to always have our eyes out there on what's coming next, not necessarily breaking our businesses by picking up every new bleeding edge tool that comes out, um, but being aware of what's there because, you know, folks like to say, um, you know, AI is not going to replace agents, but agents using AI will replace other agents. Um, and it might be cliche, but the point is there. That has been the progression of the real estate agent and real estate broker over decades has been more and more efficient companies through technology and processes um, becoming bigger and bigger players in the space. So we'll, we'll definitely see that continue um, and the technology will continue making all of the mundane go into the background so we can focus more on the intelligence and the insights of the agent having that personal relationship with the consumers. So if our agents or brokers, our listeners want to hear more about what you all do, do you guys do podcasts or how can they kind of be frontline in the know to keep up on the best way to utilize the products? So they can go to reso.org. That's R-E-S-O.org. And uh, if you go to the news section, we've got a blog. You can sign up for monthly updates. Um, some of it may be very in the weeds because we've got technical engineers. And some of it is just for any business person um, who wants to know what's happening with new technology. So take the good with the bad. If the, uh, if the technical stuff isn't your thing, uh, there's still plenty of interest there. And then we have conferences twice a year. Um, this year, we're going to be in Frisco, Texas um coming up here in a couple of months so that's it's available for the people who really want to get deep into what riso does awesome well thank you so much for taking the time to come on our podcast today um i'm always impressed with every time i hear you speak and um and you just are doing a phenomenal job they're lucky to have you so thank you so much for joining us today uh, thank you both for having me here bye sam